In vain have their calumniators been called upon to prove their statements. They simply charge it, they simply relate it, but that is no evidence. The Emperor Julian did what he could to prevent Christians destroying each other. He held pomp and pride in contempt. In battle with the Persians, he was mortally wounded. Feeling that he had but a short time to live, he spent his last hours in discussing with his friends the immortality of the soul. He declared that he was satisfied with his conduct, and that he had no remorse to express for any act he had ever done. The first great infidel was Giordano Bruno. He was born in the year of grace, 1550. He was a Dominican friar, a Catholic, and afterwards he changed his mind. The reason he changed was because he had a mind. He was a lover of nature, and said to the poor hermits in their caves, to the poor monks in their monasteries, to the poor nuns in their cells, Come out in the glad fields, come and breathe the fresh free air, come and enjoy all the beauty there is in the world. There is no God who can be made happier by you being miserable. There is no God who delights to see upon the human face the tears of pain, of grief, of agony. Come out and enjoy all there is of human life. Enjoy progress, enjoy thought, enjoy being somebody and belonging to yourself. He revolted at the idea of transubstantiation. He revolted at the idea that the eternal God could be in a wafer. He revolted at the idea that you could make the trinity out of dough, bake God in an oven, as you would a biscuit. I should think he would have revolted. The idea of a man devouring the creator of the universe by swallowing a piece of bread. And yet, that is just as sensible as any of it. Those who, when smitten on one cheek, turn the other, threaten to kill this man. He fled from his native land and was a vagabond in nearly every nation of Europe. He declared that he fought not what men really believed, but what they pretended to believe. And, do you know, that is the business I am in. I am simply saying what other people think. I am furnishing clothes for their children. I am putting on exhibition their offspring, and they like to hear it. They like to see it. We have passed midnight in the history of the world. Bruno was driven from his native country because he taught the rotation of the earth. You can see what a dangerous man he must have been in a well-regulated monarchy. You see, he had found a fact, and a fact has the same effect upon religion that dynamite has upon a Russian czar. A fellow with a new fact was suspected and arrested and they always thought they could destroy it by burning him. But they never did. All the fires of martyrdom never destroyed one truth. All the churches of the world have never made one lie true. Germany and France would not tolerate Bruno. According to the Christian system, this world was the center of everything. The stars were made out of what little God happened to have left when he got the world done. God lived up in the sky, and they said this earth must rest upon something. And finally, science passed its hand clear under, and there was nothing. It was self-existent in infinite space. Then the church began to say they didn't say it was flat, not so awful flat, it was kind of rounding. According to the ancient Christians, God lived from all eternity and never worked but six days in his whole life, and then had the impudence to tell us to be industrious. I heard of a man going to California over the plains, and there was a clergyman on board, and he had a great deal to say, and finally he fell in conversation with the 49er, and the latter said to the clergyman, Do you believe that God made this world in six days? Yes, I do. They were then going along the Humboldt. Says he, Don't you think he could put in another day to advantage right around here? Bruno went to England and delivered lectures at Oxford. 
he found that there was nothing taught there but superstition, and so called Oxford the wisdom of learning. Then they told him they didn't want him any more. He went back to Italy, where there was a kind of fascination that threw him back to the very doors of the Inquisition. He was arrested for teaching that there were other worlds, and that stars are suns around which revolve other planets. He was in prison for six years. During those six years, Galileo was teaching mathematics. Six years in a dungeon. And then he was tried, denounced by the Inquisition, excommunicated, condemned by brute force, pushed upon his knees while he received the benediction of the church, and on the 16th of February, in the year of our Lord, 1600, he was burned at the stake. He believed that the world is animated by an intelligent soul, the cause of force but not of matter, that matter and force have existed from eternity, that this force lives in all things, even in such as appear not to live, in the rock as much as in the man that matter is the mother of forms and the grace of forms, that the matter and force together constitute God. He was a pantheist, that is to say, he was an atheist. He had the courage to die for what he believed to be right. The murder of Bruno will never, in my judgment, be completely and perfectly revenged until from the city of Rome shall be swept every vestige of priests and pope, until from the shapeless ruins of St. Peter's, the crumbled Vatican and the fallen cross of Rome, rises a monument sacred to the philosopher, the benefactor, and the martyr, Bruno. Voltaire was born in 1694. When he was born, the natural was about the only thing that the church did not believe in. Monks sold amulets, and the priests cured in the name of the church. The worship of the devil was actually established, which today is the religion of China. They say, God is good, he won't bother you, Joss is the one. They offer him gifts, and try and soften his heart. So in the Middle Ages, the poor people tried to see if they could not get a shortcut and trade directly with the devil, instead of going round about through the church. In these days, witnesses were cross-examined with instruments of torture. Voltaire did more for human liberty than any other man who ever lived or died. He appealed to the common sense of mankind. He held up the great contradictions of the sacred scriptures in a way that no man, once having read him, could forget. For one, I thank Voltaire for the liberty I am enjoying this moment. How small a man a priest looked when he pointed his finger at him. How contemptible a king. Toward the last of May, 1778, it was whispered in Paris that Voltaire was dying. He expired with the most perfect tranquility. There have been constructed most shameless lies about the death of this great and wonderful man, compared with whom all his calumniators, living or dead, were but dust and vermin. From his throne at the foot of the Alps, he pointed the finger of scorn at every hypocrite in Europe. He was the pioneer of his century.